Still, the state, I know there was a big kerfluffle about that, but I don't know how it finished up. Does anybody know, is it still the official state song? Because it's somewhat deceptive, just like a lot of people's concepts about this state of ours and its participation in the American Civil War. It's deceptive in a couple ways. First of all, it wasn't really about Florida at all. When he first wrote it, Stephen Foster, it was the P.D. River, and then it was suggested that he change it to the Yazoo River, and then they found the Suwannee River, Suwannee River, on the map, but he took out the U so that it would work better in his song, Suwannee, you get the point. Also, what is it about? He's longing for the old plantation. Well, if you don't try and make the song politically correct and take out that word darky, it starts to get kind of complicated. An African American is yearning for the old plantation? Not usually. But you listen to the song, what he's really yearning for is his family. That's where the old folks stay. We don't know why he's roaming around. We know that if you folks are historians, that if he were an escape slave because of the Dred Scott decision, he couldn't just be wandering around. So maybe he bought his own freedom, or maybe he was leased out, but he wants to come back to his family. He, it's home was his family. And let's face it, the slave system was not particularly family oriented when you're talking slave folk families weighed against profit. So we're going to take a brief trip back into that time with my friend Loring, who actually, well actually before we go anywhere, what is the Suwannee Divide? Well, the Suwannee Divide, you might say that term started with Andy Jackson. Andy drove those Seminoles when he invaded West Florida right down and across the Suwannee River. So that was the Suwannee Divide. And then it separates Middle Florida and East Florida. So there you have the Suwannee Divide. Because the Suwannee River runs more north and south. That's correct, yeah. absolutely. Aha, okay, all right. 
So ladies and gentlemen, a friend of mine, he comes from, well actually a, a pretty successful cotton family, but cotton business out of Charleston. A lot of family connections to New England. And for some reason, are you the youngest son? Or why did you decide that you were going to leave the business end of it and get your hands dirty and raise cotton? Well, here, here was the deal. I grew up up there in Charleston, and my family was in that uh, cotton business, and we were very successful. But I could see that a lot of people were making bigger money with plantations, and starting plantations. So as a young man, I thought to myself, if I can find some land, I'm going to start a plantation. So what I decided to do, the federal government opened up all kind of land in Florida because of the Seminole War. They set up what they called the Homestead Act. And with that Homestead Act, you could come down to Florida, build yourself a house, cultivate the land, and then you could buy it real cheap. In fact, they'd practically give it to you if you'd stay out there. There was one little catch. You had to agree to fight the Seminoles when they got ready to attack. But they were pretty well driven south anyway because the planters, you know, most of those, or not most of them, but a lot of those Seminoles were escaped slaves anyway. So the planters just hated them, so they kept driving them uh, south. So I decided I'd just start my plantation up there around Bronson, close to the Suwannee River. And that's what I did. I started a little plantation up there, built myself a cabin like this, and uh, got started and uh, had a lot of ambition to make a lot of money in the cotton business. And uh, that's the way it started out. You know, Florida was born to violence. And uh, that's why I was in Florida, to get that free land because of that violence. And uh, so I came down here, and I got going. Oh, Emma, oh, you turn around, you dig a hole in the ground. Oh, Emma, oh, well, a master, he be a hard, hard man. Oh, Emma, oh, hey, you turn around, you dig a hole in the ground. Oh, Emma, oh, cotton cotton system of the South meant slaves. Yes? Did you own slaves? Well, I did own slaves. Almost by accident. It was a weird occurrence that uh, I got those slaves. You see, when I got married, my wife had grown up with a young girl, and that young girl was the daughter of the house servant of the family. And so when we got married, that girl was given to my wife as a present. Well, when we decided to move to Florida, that was a problem because she just pitched a fit because she was going to have to be leaving her Jake, and she didn't want to do that. So I made up my mind I was going to buy Jake, but the owner wouldn't sell him. So what I did, I challenged that old boy to a horse race, and I won Jake fair and square, and we came to Florida. So, you owned a family, and Jake, did Jake know anything about cotton? Well, here was the story with Jake. As it turned out, that was the best thing that ever happened to me because I knew the cotton business. My family knew the cotton business. There was no problem with that. Keep using the term as business. It, <laughs> as it turns out, I didn't know anything about raising cotton, really. I thought I did. I thought I'd learned a little bit. But it was Jake that knew how to raise that cotton because he'd been on the plantation there in South Carolina. And Jake, without Jake, you know, I wouldn't have made it. So your slave is the one that really knows what's going on in raising cotton. You're the master, he's the slave, but he's the one basically telling you what to do. Jake saved my bacon. 
That's what, that's what it came down to. Jake saved your bacon. Yep, that's it. And things went pretty well. Things went very well. And they well. were looking good. They were looking real well. Prospering. You were even we were, talking at times about, if I remember correctly, expanding, which meant that you would have to get more slaves. Well, that could have been a possibility, but uh, things were going so well, we weren't quite sure how it was going to come down. You know, they just finished a new railroad. It ran almost right by my farm, just up north of Jacksonville, and that was a port on the Atlantic Ocean, which guess what that did for me? That opened the entire world market to my cotton. Things were, things were really booming, and, we, and Jake and I were bringing in that cotton. So the railroad ran to Fernandina, and yeah. that was where they loaded the cotton off the railroad, well, you hope the railroad that was coming, yeah. uh, onto vessels that would take it all the way to Birmingham, England. Huh. All right. Um, oh, way down south where the cocks do crow, way down in Florida, the gals all dance to the old banjo, we'll roll the cotton down. Rolling, rolling, rolling the whole world round. Oh, the brown girl mine down in Georgia line, we'll roll the cotton down. And what can we do in Tampa Bay, way down in Florida? Florida, but getting them yaller gals all my pay, roll them cotton down. Rolling, rolling, rolling the whole world round. Let Brown got a mind down the Georgia line, we'll roll the cotton down. Stevedore song from. That's right, there they were. Working your cotton. Right there in Fernandina, loading that cotton up off that train, getting the ships. Things were going real well. Then what happened? Well, what happened, the crazies. Just the, the crazies got in control. You see, what happened when President Lincoln was elected, they decided, a lot of them, that they wanted to secede from the Union. And so they embarked on doing that. The governor, he asked the legislators, he said, call a secession convention. And they did. And uh, so they called that for January in 1861. They had a little election. Well, I thought, well, I'll run as a unionist. This, this uh, secession business, it just doesn't make a bit of sense to me. So I ran as a unionist, but I lost. And then those, those uh, delegates went right up to that secession convention. And uh, up there, you know, there are only a few unionists that were elected to the convention anyway. <laughs> But those secessionists were so determined to win that they threatened those boys and they said, if you don't vote for secession, you're not going to get back home. So you better vote, vote for secession. And to nobody's surprise, the vote really turned out 62 to 7. And we sat out on that course and there we went, seceding from the Union. Oh, Southerns, hear your country call you A blessed worse than death befall you To arms, to arms, to arms, Dixieland Lo, the beacon fires are lighted Let all hearts be now united To arms, to arms, to arms, Dixieland Well, if that's the flag of Dixie Hurrah, hurrah In Dixieland, I'll pick my stand to live and die Dixieland, two arms, two arms, we'll fight and die in Dixie. Or old Abe, they say, is mighty tight and cannot sleep a wink tonight. Or maybe from some of your folks, things like, oh, way down south where grows the cotton, 76 seems quite forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, victory's band. We'll march upon the ranks of rebels, tramp them underfoot like pebbles. Look away, march away. Look away, victory's band. But we didn't march upon the ranks of rebels and tramp them underfoot like pebbles, did we? No, we did not. Uh, we seceded all right. And uh, the ladies over in Duval County made up this flag. They brought it right over to the secession convention. And they presented it to all those delegates the day that secession ordinance was signed up there in Tallahassee on January the 10th, 1861. 
And that flag, it stayed right in the House of Representative chambers during the entire Civil War. It's kind of a complicated looking flag. It's a complicated looking flag, and yes it is, but you can see these stars here, Florida, Alabama, or excuse me, Florida, Mississippi, and South Carolina. The first three states to go out of the Union. And you know, to me, it just seemed ridiculous that we thought that we could be an independent country. Just imagine that. We had a population of 140,000 people, and 60,000 of those people were slaves. Now how are we going to be independent? Do you think that might work? The legislature, they proceeded right forward, and here's what they did. Right away, they adopted the official flag of the country of Florida. And here's our flag, and we're going to stand tall and be an independent country. That is the stars and bars. That's correct. Not this. That's right. Stars and bars. We are a band of brothers related to the soil, fighting for our liberty with treasure, blood, and toil. And when our rights are threatened, our cry rolls near and far. Hurrah for the bonnie blue flag that bears a single star. Hurrah, hurrah for southern rights, hurrah. Hurrah for the bonnie blue flag that bears a single star. As long as the Union was faithful to her trust, like friends and brethren, and we're kind and we are just. But when the northern treachery attempts our rights to mar, we'll hoist on high the bunny blue flag that bears a single star. Hurrah, hurrah for southern rights, hurrah! Hurrah for the bunny blue flag that bears a single star. Aha! I was just singing what was sort of the Confederate national anthem. But it wasn't about the stars and bars. It was about this one. That's right. Which actually, and you know something, this actually got its start in Florida many years prior to that, the war, didn't it? That flag got its start in Florida, the Republic of West Florida. When those boys tried to, tried to uh, set up an independent country in a territory uh, before Florida and Alabama and Mississippi was part of the United States. So politics in Florida was always a little... Always uh, a little confusing. Uh, a little confusing. <laughs> That's exactly and right. And then, at the Confederate uh, National Convention, and they formed the Confederate States of America, they pick the flag, the stars, and bars. But the Bonnie Blue Flag was such a great song, they decided they'd keep that for their... Uh, National Anthem. But now you got a problem. <clears throat> Although this is the flag that the Confederacy used for the majority of the war, do you see where the problem might be? Because you're fighting somebody that has a flag like this. This is actually a battle pennant. But you can see where there might be a little confusion. And there was. The Battle of Manassas. Beauregard saw a company of men approaching his men. He's trying to figure out who they are, friend or foe, and he determines that they are flying the noble stars and bars. But then a breeze sets up and the flag drifts up a little bit and it's not the stars and bars, it's the stars and stripes. Beauregard made a boo-boo. Almost cost him a skirmish there. That night he goes into his tent with a bunch of other generals, Jackson being one of them, and they determine that they need a battle flag that's going to stand out from the federal flag. You're not going to make any mistakes. So they end up with this. This is a little different from all the other flags. This is not the flag you see at the intersection of I-75 and I-4. This is a battle flag. It's square. This is what, also, this is the cross of St. Andrew. They were going to have the cross of St. George, but 
there were a lot of Jews that were in the higher ups of the Confederate government. And they're saying, wait a minute, we don't want to marry our new nation to a specific religion. So we end up with this. Then they get the idea, we're going to make a new national flag, and they come up with this one, where they put the battle flag up in one corner. You can't see it, but all the rest of the flag is white. It's supposed to stand for peace. Some people commented, isn't it interesting that for your flag, you have a battle flag with a flag signifying peace. <laughs> Although Mary Boykin Chestnut said the white stood for purity. But you had another problem. Your flag is, it doesn't look it here, but it's basically white, and you're fighting a war. You said, it happened a couple times. Oh, you're sorry. Oh no, we're not surrendering. Oh, my mistake. <laughs> so what they end up doing is they adopt that's the unstained banner. This is the blood-stained banner. Now, if you see this on the back of somebody's pickup truck, you know that they know a little bit about what they think they know. Of. <laughs> Put the red stripe down the end of it. Interestingly. This flag was not adopted officially until the early mid-March of 1865. So this flag got to fly for maybe about a month in battle. And that's just a little bit of the history of the many flags of the Confederacy. And you know, we all wondered how in the heck those uh, secessionists thought they could win a war. I mean, it was clear that the North had much more resources than we did. Here in Florida, we only had 400 miles of railroad. But what we figured was, if we could associate and confederate with bigger states and more powerful states, then we could get along and the North wouldn't attack us because we'd be strong. And we also felt that with our cotton, there was a good chance that England would come in on our side because we were providing the cotton for the world. And England needed that, that cotton. The English economy was basically driven by cotton. In fact, I think uh, it was money from the cotton south that basically financed the Industrial Revolution of the world. That's exactly right. And that's why we could make so much money in King, cotton. King we cotton. Were, we were the richest area in the entire world. There's no question about it. So we thought we had a lot of things going for us. And at first, we had some real success. You know, we sent our troops over. We took these forts. We made a, made a lot of progress. But unfortunately, we didn't take the ones that were really important. And the one that was most important was probably Fort Pickens up in Pensacola. And the reason was that was the best harbor on the Gulf Coast. It was a much better harbor than Mobile or the other harbors on the Gulf Coast. And that Navy Yard was very important because they had one of the most modern dry docks in the world. They just finished the thing. So it was important to get that Fort Pickens if we could but we didn't get it. There was a little lieutenant by the name of Lieutenant Adam Slimmer. And he moved all those Yankee troops out of those mainland forts and put them out on Santa Rosa Island on Fort Pickens. And that's a hard place to attack. And we never got Fort Pickens. It stayed under Yankee control the entire war. Now, I heard something, and maybe it's true, maybe it's not. I heard maybe I heard it from a Floridian, that the first shot of the Civil War, everybody thinks it was Fort Sumter. No. By a matter of hours or something? No, no, no. You heard it from a Floridian, but when's a Floridian going to give you misinformation? Is that going to happen? <laughs> no. Here, here's what happened. The first shot of the Civil War was right here in Florida, up at Pensacola. But it's kind, of a, it's kind of a story that we don't like to talk about too much. 
And I'll tell you why. A bunch of old boys, they decided they could take that Fort Barrancas. You remember that from the last slide? They thought they could take that barracks where those Union troops were. So they fortified themselves with a little liquor and they proceeded to advance. Well, one of those Yankee sentries, he heard them and he fired and he alerted the entire garrison. Those boys skedaddled. But it was the first shot of the Civil War. By at least six or seven hours. By maybe a day or two. A day or two. <laughs> yep. And things started to go from bad to worse for us. So they, they had that fort right there at the uh, end of Santa Rosa Island. It really controlled the other forts because they had the biggest guns out there. And then there's a harbinger of things to come. When we had the, when the, when the Yankees left uh, the mainland and went out to Fort Pickens, uh, they left that big Navy yard and that dry dock. Well, the Confederates thought they could make good use of that. So they ran a fast merchant ship in there, the Judah, and they're converting that Judah to a warship. They're fitting it out with guns ready to go to war to make a Confederate Navy. Well, there happened to be some Marines on the USS Colorado out in Pensacola Harbor. They didn't take too kindly to that. So one dark night, they slipped up on that boat, burned it. A little skirmish took place, the first loss of life in Florida. But it was a bad harbinger because you see what's happening. Already fire, death, and our dry docks burned up. So things are going bad already. And then, most of you know who this person is. If you don't, that's Robert E. Lee. And you know, Robert E. Lee, when the war started, he was the commander of the Department of the South. Well, the Department of the South for the Confederate government, that included Florida. Well, what did Robert E. Lee do? He came down to Northwest Florida, looked at our defenses. He says, you boys, these defenses aren't doing you any good. I'm pulling them out. I'm taking these guns to someplace else where they're more useful, like Savannah or Charleston. Well, we, you might say here again, we didn't cotton to that too much. We signed up with these other states so they would help us. The first thing we see our equipment, our guns are going someplace else. It's a bit worrisome. And then, what happens after that? Just a couple of months later, the Yankees, General Grant, you probably heard of him, he overran some forts up there on the Tennessee River. And that made a real weakness in that entire southern defense line. So guess what the Confederate government did to us and the Confederate High Command? They pulled all of our troops out of Florida. The only troops they left in Florida were those that were necessary to keep the peace. And they stationed a bunch of them down on the Apalachicola River to secure that. Now, you know, the governor had his plantation right up the river, and I just wonder if there might be a connection. <laughs> Far from my home, I am 
a rebel soldier, and I'm far from my home. Yeah, a lot of them were far from home because they didn't expect to be sent up to Virginia or Tennessee or someplace like that. We thought we'd be right here in Florida looking after our homes. But they sent us away. And, you know, at first, people just signed up for the Army out of patriotism to defend our homeland. But then they decided they needed more soldiers. So the Confederate government, they put into effect conscription. That means they could just come and get you, tie you up, and put you in the army, send you up to Virginia, put you on the front of the line, and you're a cannon fodder. That's what they did. First time in American history that had ever happened. Of course, if you own 20 slaves or more, you could be exempt. So a lot of those crackers started to say, this is turning into a rich man's war but a poor man's fight. That's what they said. And I was determined if I could, I was going to figure out a way to beat that conscription. I didn't want to be sent away from my home. Here's what they did to you. They just tie you up and, see that's what they called it, volunteering down in Dixie. <laughs> Now, what happened when they pulled all of our troops out of Florida, as you might expect, what came in right behind them? Yankee troops. And when those Yankee troops got close, guess what happened? All the slaves started to run over to those Yankee lines. Slaves are running toward the Yankee lines and our people are running away. It's a mess. Everybody's running every different direction. Everybody's running in every different direction. There's no question about it. Crazy song. I, I don't usually sing it around, but uh, we're with a historical group. 1863, George Root. Interestingly, slaves sang it. The Union soldiers sang it across the lines to the Confederates. The Confederates sang it because they thought it showed how everything was going to fall apart if the slaves were free. I'll give you a verse on it. Say, darky, have you seen the master with the mustache on his face? Go along the road sometime this morning, like you're going to leave this place. He's seen a smoke way up the river where the Lincoln gunboats lay. Well, he took his coat and he left very sudden and his he's run away. Oh, the master run high, high, and the dark. kept running away if they could get any pla any place close to Union lines they'd run away they'd steal our boats they'd get on those boats and they'd try to get out to those Union gunboats that were operating that uh, blockade actually there's so many songs that we know that you may not know the origin of but there was a song was a hit song I think in the in the 60s uh, 1960s excuse me and I don't know the key would be but I'm sure you know it um, comes right from here the Georgia Sea Islands. Um. Michael rode the boat ashore. And 
then we had a terrible, terrible shock. And that was that Battle of Shiloh. They were grinding down our armies. And they were grinding us down at home. In that battle, hundreds of Floridians were killed. It was starting to look a little grim. Got something for that. We we're talking about the uh, last pensioner. Many years ago in my career, I had a lady come up to me whose father fought with Joe Johnson in the Confederate cavalry, and she just wanted to tell me that when I'd done a rebel yell in a concert, she said it's the first time she'd heard a rebel yell the way a rebel yell ought to be done in over 60 years. She said, you know, these young fellows go hooting and howling around this town thinking they sound like the Rebs do not. They sound like the Yankees sound. <laughs> And take a little nap, lay down, boys, and take a little nap, lay down, boys, take a little nap, or oh, raise a little hell in the Cumberland Gap. Oh, to burn the corn and the meal and the meat, they burn the corn and the meal and the meat, burn the corn and the meal and the meat, they left us rebels with the nothing to eat. Braxton Bragg and his rebel band, oh, Braxton Bragg and his rebel band, Braxton Bragg and his rebel band. of peace. And there, in early April 1862, two great armies collided. Just two days of fighting. The casualties were well over 20,000. You could walk across the open meadows and never touch the ground for the bodies of the dead. And they didn't just drive, grind us down with those uh, titanic battles up there in Tennessee and Virginia. They were grinding us down here at home. They had that federal blockade. The Navy was all along our coast. The slaves were running away to there, and things were getting tough. We were having a hard time even getting commodities. We couldn't get salt, and salt was necessary to process our food. Food was getting scarce, and our money was depreciating by the day. And so it was not looking very pretty, but we tried to help ourselves. We built these salt factories up and down the Gulf Coast, and we tried to boil that seawater and make salt. The state government did it. The Confederate government did it. Private enterprise did it. The guy I understand I did, did salt. We're not just talking about salt in the state here. That's how you preserved food. That's how essential it was. And you can see right out there in this picture, the Yankee gunboat, those Marines coming to shore, that factory's not going to last. And they didn't last. They destroyed every one. Famine was starting to stalk the land. People were going hungry. Some places were starting to depopulate them. More slaves ran away. And when they ran away, they just didn't go to just uh, be taken care of by somebody else. 
they worked as laborers for the uh, Union Army and the Union Navy. They volunteered as scouts for the Union Army, and they enlisted in the Union Army. And then some of our own slaves came right back to Florida. They sure and, uh, did. They sure did. They came, they came back. back this time, they were armed like this. They were coming back to rescue their families. Incredible stories. Shipping out of Hilton Head and Fernandina. Uh, the steamboat's coming round the bend. Bye-bye, sweet Rosiana. It's loaded down with guns and men. I won't be home tomorrow. Bye-bye, 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 bye-bye. Bye-bye, sweet Rosiana. Bye-bye, 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 bye-bye. I won't be home tomorrow. No more auction block for me. No more, no more. No more auction block for me. Many thousand gone. And no more drivers lash for me. No more, no more, no more drivers lash for me. Many thousand gone. You know my slave Jake stayed loyal. He was probably a little too old to run away. And uh, I like to think I treated him pretty good. But some of the men that had worked for me that I had hired the slaves, they were coming back with those units. My world was collapsing around me. It was getting really tough. And to complicate matters, not only did we have to deal with the Union Army and Navy, a lot of our own people were losing confidence in the Confederate government. And they were starting to desert from the Confederate Army. They were laying out in the swamps where they couldn't catch them for conscription. And a lot of those people started to organize in guerrilla bands. And these bands were getting arms and supplies from the Federal Navy. It was getting to be an awful tough time. But we did have a few things going for us. This Captain Dickinson, he made a deal with the Confederate government and the governor and they said, Captain, if you'll organize a unit, you can stay here in Florida and you can defend Florida as best you can. And that's what he did. And I happened to get lucky because one day I was in Bronson, he was bringing a patrol through, and I had a chat with him. I said, Captain, I'd sure like to sign up with your unit because if I don't do that, I'm going to be conscripted. I don't want that to happen. He said, well, weren't you a unionist? Didn't you uh, run for the secession convention as a unionist? I said, yes, sir, I did. But I was lucky because the sheriff just happened to be there, and we he overheard that conversation, and the sheriff vouched for me. And so he let me sign up with Captain Dickinson's unit. And I'll tell you, with Captain Dickinson, he was good. He bamboozled those Yankee generals. They never could get to the interior over by Tallahassee and across the Suwannee River. That Swanee Divide was holding up because of my Captain Dickinson. He'd ambush them. He'd surprise them in their camps. They thought he had a huge army, but he only had about a few hundred men. At the most, we ever had about four or five hundred men. But things were turning against us more and more. They decided to invade Florida through Jacksonville. A general by the name of Seymour came to Jacksonville with regiments of white troops and black troops and he started marching west toward Tallahassee and towards that bridge over the Swanee River. So we had a little conference with Captain Dickinson and we knew we couldn't stop him. But our orders were to do the best we could. But we weren't going to stop an army of 5,000 men with just a few hundred. It was just impossible. But we had a break. 
General Seymour, I don't know what was the matter with that man, but he couldn't decide what he wanted to do. And he kind of dilly-dallied around, and he'd come west a few days, and then he'd go back east. He finally decided to go west and go ahead with his invasion. But in the meantime, a Georgia brigade came down, marched down from Georgia to help us out. And by the time Seymour's army got to Olusty, we could match a man for man. And we had a hell of a battle, let me tell you. It was the third bloodiest battle of the Civil War in proportion to the troops involved. And I want to tell you something. Some of those black troops that were fighting, they'd never been taken to the rifle range to learn how to fight, fire their weapons. And yet they stood. They stood on their line and were slaughtered. And the bravery wasn't even on that side either. It was over on our side, I'll tell you what. We ran out of ammunition. Our officers ran up in front of the line and said, hold this line, boys. Make yourself seen. And you know what? We did it. It was just one bloody, awful mess. The years crept slowly by, Lorena. The snow is on the grass again. The sun's low down the sky, Lorena. Flowers have been, but the heart throbs on as warmly now as when the summer days drew nigh. Oh, the sun can never dip so low. Cloudless sky, the sun can never dip so low down affection's cloudless sky. That was the song of the south that was sung around the hearths of the homes and the campfires of the men and military bands on hillsides while the men fought and died in battle. And that horrible battle, the lusty, was a turning point because it proved to Abraham Lincoln and the rest of the nation that not only were black troops essential, but that in battle, black and white would fight together like brothers. And that little fact changed the course of the war. And you know, the war wasn't over for us either. You know, we, we won that battle at Olusty. Seymour hot-footed it right back to Jacksonville. But they didn't give up. There was a general by the name of Newton. Newton decided he was going to invade Florida too. He wanted his last gasp last grasp at uh, glory and he thought he could get that glory if he could take Tallahassee because Tallahassee was the last capital east of the Mississippi River to fall and Newton wanted it so he landed with an amphibious force mostly black troops down in St. Mark's and he headed north to Tallahassee but he never got there because before he got there a natural bridge at the St. Mark's River we built fortifications, and we, we put up cannons behind those fortifications. And that General Newton, he ordered those black troops to make a frontal assault against those fortifications. Well, we just slaughtered them. And that was that. And they went back down to the Gulf. And Tallahassee didn't fall. That battle right there at Natural Bridge kept the Yankee troops out of Tallahassee. But then, after Robert E. Lee surrendered, General Johnston surrendered, finally, that happened in April, 
in May, Yankee troops came on into Florida, rode right into Tallahassee. General McCook, unopposed, he didn't have to conquer the town. The state government had ceased to exist. The governor had put a pistol in his mouth and blew his brains out. He said, the personality of the Yankees has become so odious that death is preferable to living with Yankees. The lieutenant governor knew he was a traitor and he ran off and hid. So that's how it was ended up for us folks. It was not a pretty situation, not in the least. You can see from this map how much of Florida the Yankees occupied. And when they occupied some place, what'd they do? They burned it. Pensacola was burned down. Jacksonville was burned down. And that's not all. There were raids all across Florida. All the way over to Fort Meade, all the way down to Gainesville. Gainesville was raided twice. And you know what happens when those raids, it's not pretty. I can guarantee you that. And this is what happened. When you know, Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah. We'll give him a hearty welcome then, hurrah, hurrah. The men will cheer, the boys will shout, the ladies, they will all turn up. And we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. And you know what? For Florida, a lot of our people never came home. We sent more troops in proportion to our population than any other state. But a third of them never came home. Another third of them came back like this or worse, it was devastating to our state. I'll tell you, I can't figure out what was accomplished by all that death, fire, and destruction. But there was a big change in attitude in our state, I can guarantee you that. And if you'll just bear with me to explain it a little bit, I'll read to you what my wife said before the war and what she said when we surrendered. My wife, Blanche, acknowledged that the North might go to war to preserve the Union, although the prospect didn't scare her in the least. Everybody knows the South can defeat the North. We raise honorable fighting men. The North raises laborers. Well, that's kind of an unrealistic attitude, no question about it, but that's what she believed. But. When we surrendered, it had changed. Here's what she said. We believe our men could win, and they darn near did. But Yankee invaders kept coming with more soldiers and new equipment all the time. Now we're a conquered people that the Negroes will control. Everything is disordered. It'll take a hundred years for Florida to recover. And in truth, a hundred years was not near long enough. And depending on who you talk to and why, we haven't gotten it over it yet. Thank you. Thank you.